So it's my pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Wassam Ismail. Uh, she is a well-known figure in the nephropathology in Egypt, in the Middle East, Arab world, and most probably all over the world because she is deputy uh, for uh, nephropathology for ISN, and she is uh, well educated and she has uh, own lab for the nephropathology, and she has a lot of research internationally uh, recognized. Uh, so Professor Osam Ismail delivered many presentation, and this is the, the last meeting for the nephropathology. By the end of this session, Professor Osam Ismail had a very nice uh, full booked library for nephropathology, and I think it will uh, it is a treasure for all nephrologists and uh, pathologists. Uh, I, I want to uh, just to go in a tour, rabbit tour, in two minutes or three minutes in this site to show how to use a virtual academy and how to uh, reach to uh, the presentations because this is one of the questions that I, I am frequently asked. If we write on the Google ESNT Virtual Academy, then it will be opened. You'll find Arabic, English, so select English style, and this is the English style. You'll find a lot of categories in nephrology, dialysis, transplantation, conferences, questions, quizzes, nephropathology. But I'm going to start with the YouTube channel. If you uh, click on the YouTube, go please to playlist, because playlist include a lot of lists for nephrology, transplantation, dialysis, uh, critical care, AKI, everything. And I'm going just to hit the nephropathology uh, uh, playlist, and it is not for all nephropathology, it is for the webinars. For 14, up to, four. so this, this is one of the presentation. So you can go to the list and listen what you what you'd like. And then, one of the advantage of this site is to have this index. If you click, if you click, if you click and just write with Sam Ismail here in the lecture index, you will find the presentation of Professor Usam. Thirty-four lectures on the Virtual Academy and the videos. You'll find more than 14 videos, 18 videos are already there. Uh, also, uh, if you go to the conference, you'll find a lot of conferences starting from 2012. And these are the conferences of, two, of 2020. For example, if you click this is the 18th annual international conference of Jordan. You'll find all presentations that you can download. Another important point in this video. If you go to the pathology you, and you open the ECNT webinars, please hear uh, I like to just to uh, raise uh, the attention. If any of the attendee wants to have an official certificate from Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation that he attended and participated in the webinars of Professor Wissam, beside attending, and uh, the, anyone should review the videos and then go directly to this quiz assessment. And any, uh, any attendee uh, who have 70% score or above, he had the right to uh, for a certificate signed by uh, Professor Wissam, by Professor Hanna Hafiz, and uh, by myself, uh, because this is the, uh, the the right of attendees to have official documentation for. Uh, and this is uh, MD nephrology, and all the list of the webinars are there. I'm not going to bother you by the details. And uh, so this is the 15th uh, session of nephropathology live webinars because we have a lot of presentation in the virtual academy of the videos and the presentations 
that were presented in conferences. Today, it is a very special session, as Professor Hussam promised. Uh, she will discuss viral related injury of the graft, and then she has uh, interesting cases at, af af after the lecture. And I'm sure that it will be very, very rich end of the live webinars of nephropathology. This is the end of the, of, uh, in this time, but we are going to update uh, after a couple of months, there will be updates with Professor Hussam again and again because we cannot work in nephrology without the help of pathologists and the one of the uh, very ma uh, qualified and mastering the nephropathology, Professor Hussam Smail. The mic is with you, Professor Hussam. And before you are going to talk, I, um, I invite Professor Halawa to uh, welcome Professor Hussam and welcome all attendees. Professor Halawa. Thank you very much, Professor Hussain. Um, we are very grateful to Professor Hussam Smail for the nice presentation. And I, you know, we learn a lot. We definitely we learn a lot. Slides up to date. Uh, enjoy the discussion. Enjoy the company with colleagues, eminent friends. And actually, uh, you know, I got a lot of feedback from uh, my colleagues from the University of Liverpool, and they asked me for the link, which you're going to send me, you know, hopefully tomorrow, the four, four links to send them to all of them. Okay. Uh, we have on our, you know, on our list is more than 230 uh, students. And, you know, but because it's a global uh, course, so the, you, you can't come because, you know, it's seven o'clock or eight o'clock uh, Cairo time means two o'clock in Singapore, which is quite difficult. But um, she become very popular worldwide now. Okay. And I think the presence of the recorded videos is a real treasure. Thank Absolutely. you very much, Professor Hussam. And please uh, share your slides. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hussain and Professor Ahmed for the uh, great words and thank you very much for the feedback. It's really a great pleasure and um, I have to say I'm sorry that this is the last session because uh, really this was uh, the bright uh, point of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic we're living uh, in. And, uh, it is the last session this month. <laughs> You're trapped, <Hussain>. <laughs> <laughs> No escape. <laughs> no escape, yes. No escape, yes. Well, uh, Go ahead, please. I have to thank uh, Hussein for all his effort, for, uh, for the idea, for all uh, the effort uh, backdoor with the links, with the recording, with the, uh, with the contact with uh, everybody, actually, and managing to, uh, to have us all here with this great host of my colleagues and professors and all our junior uh, colleagues. And um, apart from everything and apart from the science, it's really a great pleasure to be um, with all of you. So today is going to be uh, our last session in uh, transplant pathology. Uh, of course, I did not cover every uh, single thing. I, we covered the major and important uh, things, at least from the point of view of uh, pathology. And uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, viral nephropathies, mainly poliomavirus nephropathy, and with a slight highlight on others. Um, is the voice okay? It's okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Now you all know that in relation to transplant infectious disease, that prevention, diagnosis, and management are actually major contributors to clinical organ transplantation. And because of their importance, actually uh, the American uh, Society of Transplant Infectious Disease had, has its own guidelines in relation of the management of um, uh, infectious disease. I wanted to yeah, include them, but actually I didn't have time, so I'm going to we did not include them in the slide, but I'm going to mention, it, uh, to mention them uh, as we go through. We know that the risk of infection for a transplant recipient at any point in time after transplantation is actually a function of two factors. The epidemiologic exposure of the patient and the organ donor, including recent nosocomial and remote exposures, as well as the patient's net state of immunosuppression, including all factors which are going to contribute to the risk of infection. So it's never a single factor. Epidemiological exposure, as you can see, for transplant recipients, it could include a very long list, 
and of course uh, of uncommon infections which we don't see in uh, the normal uh, population. Viruses, bacteria, fungus, uh, parasites, nosocomial exposures and uh, community exposures like food and waterborne infections, respiratory viruses and so on as well as viruses which are mainly targeting the graft as polyoma virus and atypical respiratory pathogens. The next state of immunosuppression basically depends on the immunosuppressive therapy, the type, sequence, and intensity, intense anti-rejection treatment versus the maintenance uh, therapy the patients are on. Prior therapies also need to be included when you're evaluating the next state of the immunosuppression of the patient, the patient was a malignant patient, they receive any chemotherapy, antimicrobials, or a, any treatment for post-transplant malignancy. You need to consider that integrity of the mucocutaneous barrier, catheters, lines, drains, were they compromised, uh, the presence of neutropenia, lymphopenia, hypogammaglobulinemia, often drug-induced, but maybe this is the inherent disease of the patient, technical complications, graft injury, patients had any fluid collections, any wounds, underlying immune defects, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, genetic polymorphisms and metabolic conditions and so on. I'm sure that you're aware of all of these uh, factors uh, more than me, but since we are discussing uh, infection, we have always to bear it in mind because sometimes we get surprised why the patients present with these infections. And the association of immunosuppression and infectious syndromes mainly of uh, the stronger the immunosuppression is, the more chance, as you all know, that you're going to have uh, a more infection. Some immunosuppressives are more related to specific infections, like costimulatory blockets, for example. They have a possible increased risk for Epstein-Barr and PTLD. Uh, plasmapheresis induces encapsulated bacteria, um, uh, ATGs cause activation of latent viruses, as well as encapsulated bacteria. CNIs, for example, are a major risk factor for herpes and for polyoma and so on. If we come to consider the, um, a, the overall course of patients in a transplant, it's usually divided in, uh, into periods, uh, the first month or before the first month is over, then during the first year, then after the first year. So with standard immunosuppressive regimens, most common infections occur in a relatively predictable pattern. And this pattern depends on the time elapsed since transplantation. So you can more or less predict which, uh, what you're dealing with. So the pattern of infection usually changes with alterations in the immunosuppressive regimen. And this is actually a reflection of also changing risk factors over time. So within the first month, you have different risk factors in the first year and then after the first year. So the first year usually reflects the immunosuppression, including induction therapies and prophylaxis. So that what you're going to give your patient during the first month, you're going to see its result usually during the first year. And then after that, the incidence decreases of what you can see within the first year and increases for other, uh, for mainly for community acquired infections. However, some infections stays uh, persistent like CMV, where you can have it first year and it continues with the time lapse of the uh, transplant, as well as uh, PTLD. We all know, or we, uh, what we know as a fact that PTLD has a very high risk during uh, the first year, uh, especially the first three months post-transplant, but actually no, you can see PTLD as, um, as old as 20 years post-transplant. Fungal infections can have aspergillus after the first year. Cryptococcus is also starting to be common, and we see it. TB, tuberculosis, don't forget it. If, you, if you're in a country with a history uh, of TB or you're more susceptible to get uh, TB. Also parasitic infection, and remember that parasitic infections and protozoas behave in a different pattern and can be much more injurious in transplant patients rather than the common population. Okay, now let's talk about our main concern, which concerns the graft and at, uh, at least concerns uh, the pathologists more, uh, which is which are polyoma viruses. Now, polyoma viruses, polyoma polyoma D basically means poly multiple and oma tumors. So these are oncogenic tumors, and the first ones which were discovered were the simian virus, as we foresee. Uh, which is the uh, marine polyoma virus, but then we found out the human polyoma, polyoma viruses like BK virus, 
and BK is known to cause polyomavirus nephropathy and hemorrhagic cystitis. It also seems to be linked to salivary gland inflammation and sclerosis in HIV-infected patients. There is also emerging evidence that links the polyoma BKV strain to oncogenesis in rare cases, actually not very rare cases. Now we have strong evidence that it's, uh, because we have some research also going on in this, uh, in this arena, that it's really related to uh, urinary bladder carcinoma in immunocompromised patients, and also in some cases of immunocompetent patients. Then the JC virus, which mainly uh, causes multifocal leukoencephalopathy in HIV patients, but also JC affects the urinary tract, can cause cystitis, and it does not cause nephropathy, but it can be present within the tubular epithelium as a latent infection. Of Merkel cell carcinoma virus. Merkel cell carcinoma is a recent type of uh, polyoma virus, and Merkel cell is a rare uh, disease, uh, malignancy of the skin, and it also has been related to polyoma viruses. Then we have other types of um, uh, viruses. Now the family of uh, polyoma contains around 12 viruses when we started only with three viruses. You know that BK and JC are labeled after the initials of the first patients they were discovered in. However, then the viruses are related to the diseases they, uh, it's related to. They are named uh, according to the disease they are related to. And I don't know the KIWU, uh, PI, I don't know. Maybe they are related to specific, uh, to something else, or maybe also the names of the patients. Now, the polyoma virus is a small double-stranded DNA virus and each polyoma virus encodes three capsid proteins, viral protein VP1, VP2, and VP3. And it's the viral proteins which interact with the cell surface receptors. A penetration is usually via endocytosis, and these virions are released by cell lysis. So we have large numbers of caspids which accumulate in the nucleus and form what we call inclusion body. So this is the inclusion body you see in the nucleus. It's basically the replicated or the, divi the division of the viral capsids. And replication within the cells, this is an electron microscopy and all these rounded uh, figures are actually virus and you can see them in the cell. And per cell, the replication can range from 10,000 virions to 100,000 virions in a single cell. So this is a highly replicated virus. VP1, or the viral protein 1, including protein, is the only VP which is exposed on the outer shell of the virion. So antibodies which used we, uh, are, are directed to VP1. But you have to know that VP1 cross-reacts with the SV40, which is the murine form, with the BK virus, the human form, and the human JCV virus as well. So the SV40 stain, which we use to detect uh, Plioma virus in the kidney also cross reacts with the SV40. This is what's called SV40 stain, and it's the T large antigen, which is the one which we use because it, the antibody actually is targeted against the VP1 and also detects JC. So, but since we know that almost in up to 95% of cases, when we're looking at renal biopsies, we're looking for BKV, the chance for SV40 is nil there is a very small percentage that these, uh, these uh, inclusions could be uh, JC, but at the end of the day, um, it is more or less all uh, BK virus. Now, BVN is typically found in renal algrafts grafts and only rarely in native kidneys. There are some query reports of uh, BVN in native kidneys, but um, interestingly enough, this is a disease of renal algrafts. graft. Viral nephropathy is primarily caused by the BK strains, as I mentioned, and in approximately 10 to 20%, again, this is a reported incidence, I think the 20% is high, it is much less than that, but even in these cases, you get a simultaneous co-activation of BK and JC viruses. As I said, cases of only JC virus or SV40 virus induced BVN are rare. When they are there, that you usually you don't get a really BVN or a polyoma virus nephropathy. But because of this, we don't call it a BK nephropathy anymore. It's called a, B, a PV or a polyoma virus nephropathy. PVN is morphologically defined by the presence of viral replication in the renal parenchyma, mainly in the tubular epithelium, and vary, varying degrees of virally induced acute tubular injury. So I want you to remember that this is mainly a viral induced acute tubular injury rather than a tubular interstitial 
nephritis. Yes, you get the interstitial inflammation and the interstitial reaction later on as definitely an unavoided factor of the tubular injury, but the main pathology here is actually a tubular injury. So this is what happens. You get lysis and a marked uh, a, a, a injury to the tubular epithelium with the viral inclusions. In relation to the morphology, this is the, tubul this is the tubule, this is the tubular basement membrane, this is a very high power, and only a picture so to show you. This is a normal nucleus, and this is a nucleus with the inclusion. So you can appreciate the difference and what we mean by nuclear inclusions or large bizarre cells with bizarre nuclei. If you compare it to the normal nucleus, this is definitely an abnormal Yes, and this is the nucleus that you, we see in the urine cytology and we describe as the core cells. So this is basically the cellular morphology. In tissue, you see it this way, and in cytology, you see it as a decoy cell. Here is the tubule affected by variable types of uh, a nuclear inclusion. This is a nucleus. Of course, this is not a normal epithelium. This is injured epithelium. And here is a very nice nuclear uh, inclusion. This is the nucleus. This is the inclusion. And there are also other types of inclusion within this, within this tubule. So this is typically what we call PVN. Now, polioma virus nephropathy is not like other viruses because it actually causes more than one type of inclusion. For example, CMV has a single type of inclusion, while PVN can cause four types of inclusion, type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. This is type 1 inclusion, which we know as a smudged hyperchromatic uh, nucleus, and this is one of the commonest types of inclusions we see. Then we have type 2, which is called an owl eye, which is similar to the CMV inclusion, where you get an isenophilic body surrounded by a white halo inside uh, uh, the nucleus. This is type 2 inclusion. These are less common. And we have uh, type 3 inclusions where you get a glassy, uh, ground glass appearance of the nucleus. These are also not so common. And then the second commonest type is type 4, where you get this type of inclusion with intra these uh, seems like nucleoli inside and very vesicular nucleus. You can see the inclusions are really so much different from each uh, other. And usually patients have mixed types of inclusions, but sometimes patients present with a single type. This is the types of inclusions you can see. This is type 4 inclusion. You can see the intranuclear inclusions here. You can see the marked tubular um, injury. Again, another type of uh, inclusion. Let me show you. See, this, this is type 1, the smudged. Nuclei. This is also this is type four. Again, type one with all uh, types of uh, smudged nucleus. Then we have a uh, type three here. If you can see it, this is the ground glass nucleus. So this is typically what you get, and you have type four here. All of these are included. As I said, typically you get an, uh, an interstitial infiltrate, and the problem in these patients is that this interstitial infiltrate also called the tubulitis, and then you can get a mixed picture between is this a T-cell mediated rejection or is it a pure um, a PVM, and sometimes patients can have easily concurrent uh, rejection with the PVM uh, nephropathy. Again, this is, as you can see, you have interstitial infiltrate, we have tubulitis, but we also have tubules with marked inclusions. Look at this nucleus, this one and this one. So definitely this is a viral infection to start with, and then we see if, if there are inclusions. Sometimes PVN can cause uncommon morphological presentations like small pseudocrescents in glomeruli. Remember that for some reason, glioma does not affect the visceral uh, porocytes, but it can affect the parietal porocytes. So you can see the affection of the parietal porocytes will cause their uh, proliferation as a response to injury, and then it can give you this type of pseudocrescent with actually the inclusions you can see in the epithelial cells. And you can see here with the SV40, very nice stain of the positive parietal uh, epithelial cells, while all the visceral epithelial cells in the glomerulus are actually negative. So this was one of our cases. Also, uncommonly, it can cause some form of a tubulocentric granuloma. But this is really, really very rare. I've only heard about it. I've never seen a case, and this is not my picture. Uh, but it's reported in some, um, in some cases that it can give some form of the granuloma, the reaction, the interstitial reaction surrounding the tubules can actually give some form of granulomas 
involving the tubules itself, so it can give a false granular appearance of a granulomatous interstitial nephritis. This is the gold standard for diagnosis, and uh, it is faster and easier and much more uh, reliable, but of course it needs a biopsy, so it's an invasive technique. And this is the SV40, as you can see, a very nice, again, very easy stain, a lot reproducible, and the positivity is in the nuclei, as you can see here. Usually there is no background. Sometimes you get some tubular staining out of the a technique of the amino itself. However, even though with this tubular staining, you can still see very bright, strongly positive nuclei. So this is not a cytoplasmic staining. It's a nuclear staining, as you can see. So this is typically SV40. Again, on a higher power, see? All the nuclei with the inclusions are going to stain positive for SV40. So this is definitely, and you see the nucleus with the inclusion inside and the amount of virions inside uh, the nucleus, all of them positive for SV40. So what about decoy cells in urine? Now, I know decoy cells is um, causes a lot of confusion and some people uh, keep uh, uh, um, debating about it, but actually decoy cells in urine is a non-invasive, easy, quick, and cheap tool to assess a patient's risk for PVN. As I've, I've shown you that these decoy cells are actually the cheddar transitional epithelial cells with the viral replicated nuclei into the urine of the patient. So they are a sign of viral reactivation. However, decoy cells in urine has a negative predictive value of 100%. If there are no decoy cells in urine, then there, are, there is no pleomavirus nephropathy. However, the positive predictive value is only 27%. This is why we, have, we need to have more than five decoy cells per 10 high power field in order to start saying that this is positive for decoy cells. So what it's used? It's used is that it's an excellent screening method and it also depends on the type of the cytology technique you're using. In routine cytology smears, we, it's a five, five decoy cells. However, if a, if a more advanced technique like cytospin or thin prep, then three decoy cells are enough to say that this is a positive smear. Patients are followed up by, by decoy cells every month for the first three months, then every three months for the first two years. And if you have um, uh, an increased number of decoy cells in the urine, and this is counted by your pathologist or cytopathologist, then this is a sign that you have an increased viral replication. And then you can either do a PCR for the uh, BEK and consider this a, a presumptive uh, a, a polyomavirus nephropathy, or just take a biopsy if the patient, if it's indicated or if the patient has any clinical impairment, and then you can see if the patient has actual PVN or not. So decoy cells in urine are typical of a viral replication, but they are not diagnostic. The presence of positive decoy cells in urine tells you that you have some element of viral replication. When is it significant? It's significant when it starts to increase with each cytology screening. So a positive decoy cell cytology means that you need to repeat this cytology every month and see where your patient is developing and if the numbers are increasing after three smears or four smears, then you really need to do uh, a PCR and say, see where you're standing. If you don't have decoy cells in the urine and the and urine is negative, then you, there is no poliomavirus replication. An important point is that you need a fresh voided second morning sample. So don't get an afternoon sample or a first morning sample, and then come to say that the, uh, there was decoy cells in urine, but the patient's PCR was negative, or there were no decoy cells in urine, but the patient turned to have PVN. So do the cytology properly, and make sure that it is stained properly and examined properly, and then you can really rely on it. It's not difficult for pathologists to detect decoy cells in urine. They look like malignant cells. So you can teach your pathologist to, uh, to detect them 
in, uh, in regular cytology smears, they are not difficult at all. And the stains are available. I mean, this is stained by pap smear, so it's not a problem. We've heard about additional newer tests like the Halfen test, and this is uh, they do electron microscopy on the cytology, uh, on the urine sample. And with EM, they can actually see these bodies, collect, collecting bodies of the virally replicating cells. You can see all of these are cells. We can see the virions itself with the electron microscopy in the urine sample. And of course, this is diagnostic because the number of virions you can see. However, this technique is used only by um, a single center, as far as I know, maybe um, two other centers. Mainly, um, it, it was um, uh, described in the uh, in University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and this is where uh, they use it and they count on it. And they say that it has um, a, predictive, uh, predict a negative predictive value of higher than 90%, and that it's quite uh, specific. Okay, we, in relation to PVN itself, we have different phenotypes for poliomavirus nephropathy. Because as we agreed, the PVN can induce a tubular injury rather than a significant tubular interstitial inflammation. So we can have a minimal PVN. That means that poliomavirus replication in ra is rare and in only very few tubular cells to marked PVN. That is, the poliomavirus replication is in many tubules with marked cell lysis and acute tubular necrosis, plus or minus in an inflammatory reaction. So we can have an undetected PVN clinically and histologically. Why histologically? Because this minimal and rare tubular cells, which has PVN, can be only in the medulla. So the minimal and early stages of PVN present with normal renal function and also may not show intranuclear viral inclusion bodies, acute tubular injury, or any significant renal injury. And in such cases, a diagnosis can only be established by immunohistochemistry or by in situ hybridization. And because of this, now it is highly recommended that as we foresee, for polyoma should be performed routinely on all renal graft biopsies as we perform C4D. And there are a lot of labs and centers which deal with transplant biopsies all over the world, including Imperial College, including um, Oxford, including uh, several labs in the States which perform, and also in Switzerland, in the Basel group, they all perform SV40 routinely on their biopsies, not anymore based on suspicion because this uh, these, um, uh, research or these findings have shown us that PVN can really start minimal and early, and there is no way to detect it except if you do as we fools. So based on this morphology or in these different phenotypes of poliomavirus nephropathy, PVN can be classified into diseases, grades one to three, with disease resolution and favorable outcome in early disease, which is grade one, and a high risk of, gra uh, of graft beer in grade Three. So if we classify the PVN properly, then we can detect early cases. And now we know that not it always that the prognosis is not so gloomy. And that if we can detect when it's minimal and in an early stage, then you can do something about it. Then comes the question: does a mere diagnosis of poliomavirus nephropathy provide optimal diagnostic prognostic information? Is it enough? to just tell you that the patient has PVM? And can these different phenotypes, if we tell you that the patient has minimal early PVM or a moderate stage, he has fibrosis, he have inflammation, can predict differences in the clinical presentation and outcome? And based on these two questions, the BANF had been working since 2009 on a classification for, yes, it took that long on the classification of definitive polyoma virus nephropathy to come up with morphologic definitions and clinical correlations based on clinical pathological correlation. And that classification was published in 2018, actually late 2018. This is the classification. And I have to say, it's not a very user-friendly classification and it's not very easy to understand. And the variability between the class is, classes is actually very big. But I'm going to say the classification 
And of course, as every other classification, everyone is free to opt to use it or uh, not to use it. However, it is in the Banff classification. And actually, in Banff 2019, polyomaverse nephropathy was included as a separate category for the first time within the categories of the Banff classification before it was included as an other category, which includes all forms of viral infection. But now, in, the, in 2019, category 5 equals polyomavirus nephropathy. So we will eventually, if we're banning the patient, then we'll eventually have to use this package. If you want. So the PVN defines basically three morphologic PVN classes. Class 1, class 2, and class 3. And it uses two main criteria for the evaluation of the classes. These criteria are basically the interstitial fibrosis using the Banff regular score for interstitial fibrosis and what is known as intrarenal PV load levels. So viral load, tissue intrarenal viral load uh, uh, level. And this was statistically verified class denominators, both. So by statistics, these three were the significant class denominators. Um, I'll try to simplify the classification as much as I can. Class one is basically by the viral load. So if you have a viral load one and any form of a, a, and, a, a mild interstitial fibrosis, you're class one. If you have a viral load one, and moderate to mark the interstitial fibrosis, then you're class two. If you have a viral load two and any interstitial fibrosis, then you're class two as well. And if you have a viral load three with mild fibrosis, then you're class two. If you have a viral load of three and marked fibrosis, then you're class three. So, so class one basically defines early PVN stage and class three defines very late stage of polyomavirus nephropathy and anything which is in between is class two. Now let's see the classes. This is class one. And as you can see, this is a very nice kidney, very nice tubular epithelium. There's absolutely nothing. No inflammation, no edema, no tubulitis, no tubular injury, nothing. And see with the SV40, you have one, two, three, and four positive uh, nuclei for SV40. So what is the viral load? The viral load requires SV40 staining. This is how you measure the viral load. So if we have nuclear staining less than 1%, this is PVL or equals to, this is PVL1. That means if I have a single nucleus in a single tubule or more than one nucleus. If I have a single tubular staining, this is equals to or less than one. This is a 1%, not a 10%. So this is 1%. A single tubule in coating or in medulla with new positive nuclear staining, then you are in PVL1. So this is class one. No diagnostic inclusion, no or minor inflammation, and absolutely no fibrosis. So this is class one uh, PVL. This one had minimal inflammation going on. What about class two? Class two means that you have a viral load of more than 1% to less than 10%. And this is again the SV40 in the tubule. So if you have up to 10% affection of the tubules, positive nuclei in the, tubule, in the tubules, in the biopsy, up to 10% of the tubules present in the biopsy, then this is PVL2, then you are class two. Irrelevant of the degree of fibrosis you have and irrelevant of the inflammation. But usually these, um, these cases are associated with significant inflammation. So you have more than 1% up to 10%. Then class three, you have a viral load of more than three, sorry, this is, uh, and marked fibrosis, as you can see. This is the trichrome, and you have a viral load of more than 10%. So this is basically the classes. They are a bit um, complicated to understand. You really need to understand them as clinicians. They are problematic and not user-friendly at all for but you need to know that the important 
message in this classification is that we have class one, that we have a minimal and very early affection of with poliomavirus nephropathy that we need to do as we foresee staining routinely to detect these patients uh, in patients where they receive induction therapy, where they receive anti-rejection therapy. And uh, you need to detect these patients early uh, on to be able to detect the minimal and early stage because these stages are reported to be reversible. So these patients do not lose their crafts. And that class three is actually a very late stage. And at the end of the day, the main prognostic factor, as in everything else, is interstitial fibrosis. What about the inflammation? Now, what is it that we have an interstitial nephritis? Is it is this inflammation present in the biopsy? Is it related to the poliomavirus? So this is a PV and interstitial nephritis, or is it rejection? Fact of life is that rejection and PVN can coincide. We're not happy with this, but this is a fact. And you have to know that we do see patients and all types of rejection can coincide with PVN. It's a straightforward story when the C4D is positive. And yes, we have cases of PVN, and ABMR with positive C4D, it happens. And also when you have an entomal arthritis or a V lesion, because then you definitely know that you have a T cell mediated rejection. But the problem, the diagnostic problem is usually with the type one or T cell mediated rejection and uh, uh, whether this is, a, you have a concurrent type one tubular interstitial rejection or this is the only interstitial nephritis related to PVN. And usually this is resolved more or less if you have significant tubulitis and interstitial inflammation away from the tubules with the viral inclusions, then you most probably have a concurrent T cell mediated rejection process with it. And so hence diagnosis should contain the histological PVN stage together with the evaluation of the, uh, of the rejection and of course the C4D status. Okay, now, um, Recently, the Basel group, mainly um, uh, Helmut Hofer, have uh, reported that they see in follow-up biopsies post-PVN um, uh, patients, persistence of intraepithelial lymphocytes and interstitial inflammation after viral clearance. So these are patients which were uh, diagnosed as poliomavirus nephropathy. They were managed and the management was successful and the virus was cleared. However, on their protocol biopsies or in their follow-up biopsies, they still had persistence of intraepithelial lymphocytes. Intraepithelial lymphocytes means tubulitis. You still have active, you still have tubulitis in the graft and you have interstitial inflammation. So now what is this? Are these actually BK specific lymphocytes? So this is an anti-BK immune response. Are these HLA specific lymphocytes? That means that this is that these patients are rejecting now after the BK was managed, or this is just an, an innocent lymphocyte with an unspecific infiltrate. Well, we wish if these lymphocytes can actually talk to us and tell us what do they want and why are they being there in the graft, but unfortunately this doesn't happen. So we have to speculate. And their work was really nice. And they have concluded that during decreasing viremia, there was a significant increase in the bunf tubulitis score, T, as well as the extent of interstitial inflammatory infiltrate. They have withheld anti-rejection therapy, and they did not treat these patients, and the outcome was good. So the immune reconstitution theory came up that patients with poliomavirus nephropathy can have some form of immune reconstitution associated acute interstitial nephritis. It's a form of rebalancing of the immune system in the graft following the viral infection. So this resolving the PVN, actually we know very little, we still know very little information about it. And we know very little information about the histological changes occurring during persistent and resolving PVN simply because we don't biopsy our patients. However, these two nice studies by um, uh, Mantra Mani in 2013 and 2014, they have published the first histology-based study on resolving PVN in a cohort of patients initially diagnosed in early and florid disease stages. And also 
this study, they have shown an abundance of BK virus specific T cells to be associated with control of poliomavirus replication or when they were managing the PVN and going down with the immunosuppression with the prevention of PVN. So does reconstitution immune injury with pronounced graft inflammation really exist? Or if this is, this is a re reaction? And if so, is this a typical feature of any resolving polyomavirus nephropathy? We still have to answer this question. And is the more chronic graft injury with interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy indeed a typical endpoint in all stages of poliomavirus nephropathy. This is what we are expecting. We say patient has poliomavirus nephropathy. Patients are going to lose the graft and eventually the PVN is going to cause this chronic allograft injury. However, again, Mentor in their study during follow-up, a significant graft fibrosis and tubular atrophy was not seen at the time of disease resolution. And the UNC group, which is one of the first groups who discovered who described poliomavirus nephropathy when we ever heard about it, and they are the same group who came up with the Haufen test, they have made similar observations. PVN often does not cause relevant scarring. So the message is that in resolving poliomavirus nephropathy, and that if you manage actually to uh, go down, cause viral clearance, you're not, don't worry, because you're not going to have scarring in the kidney. And that this interstitial nephritis or this reconstitution immune injury, which we don't really know a lot about yet, is not probably a direct cause of this chronic allograft injury. This is what we know so far. So all the recent evidence was that as early as you can manage PVN, you can have actually a good result and a good outcome to your patient. It's not such a gloomy diagnosis. Okay, now let's have a case. Now, this is not my case. It's uh, a case of a friend, but it's a very nice case. So I thought you, um, I'll uh, show it to you. This was a 43-year-old female who presented with increased serum creatinine levels and fever five months post-transplantation. Maintenance therapy, tacrolimus, MMF, and steroids. So this patient presented five months post-transplant with a fever and high serum creatinine. Patient is known to have diabetes, hypertension, and she's hypothyroid. Her uh, uh, end-stage renal disease is of unknown cause. Virology is negative, mainly hepatitis C and B. Past medical history, this patient had history for tuberculosis and had an operation for an ovarian cyst. So upon presentation, patient was feverish, but alert and well-oriented, and her blood pressure was 160 over 90. Her creatinine have climbed to 1.6 from a baseline of one, urea was 90, CBC was 4.9, neutrophils were uh, 61%, hemoglobin was nine, platelets were within normal range, urine analysis uncultured, red blood cells to five uh, to, uh, per high power field, few white blood cells 10 to 15, and urine culture positive for E. coli. So in brief, this is a 43-year-old female diabetic hypertensive, presented five months post-transplant with serum create 1.6, fever, lymphopenia, and positive urine culture for E. coli, and she has a past history of tuberculosis. So would you like to have any other investigations? We've done CMV, and guess what? The CMV was positive, her TAC level was eight and her CMV was positive also by PCR. So a biopsy was taken. Now this is her biopsy. She had two nice cores and, oops, look at this. She had already significant interstitial inflammation, but even among this inflammation, which is plasma cell dominant, all of these are plasma cells, you can see that the, the epithelial cells of the tubules are not normal. These are not normal. This is a normal tubule, but these ones are not. So even on this power and among all of this inflammation, you can see that you have significant viral inclusions. But I want you to look carefully at these inclusions. See, this one is different than this type of inclusion, which has an isonophilic nucleolus. It's different than this type of inclusion, and this one is different also. And here, we also have different types of inclusions. And look here. Actually, we have a classic smudged nucleus, 
which is not an inclusion for CMV. Also, CMV does not cause variable types of inclusion. Again, look at this one. And look at this. And we have also here significant tubular injury, but we have very large cells. So if it's polyoma, we took a, smear, a cytology smear and you had there are positive decoy cells. By the time the PCR, as I said, this is a fresh voided second morning sample. But then back to the biopsy and look at these inclusions. We have this is an aphilic intranuclear inclusion. And oops, there is also an inclusion here. And this inclusion is actually not in the parietal, it's in the visceral epithelial cell. And we have another one here. And look at this one, an inclusion in the parietal cell. So this cannot be polyoma or polyoma only because polyoma does not affect the porocytes. This is the patient SV40 and you can see it's all over the place. But this is the patient's TMV as well. So this patient had CMV and polyomavirus associated nephropathy class two with concurrent CMV infection. This is an old case, so this is prior to the uh, classification. However, she will have a PVL load of three because she definitely had much more viral load than 10%. Blood PCR, CMV was positive, BK was positive, antiviral treatment, antibiotics, and overall immunosuppression was decreased, but of course, patient eventually lost the kidney and returned to dialysis. So CMV-induced algraft nephropathy. Now, this is CMV, cytomegalovirus. It's a virus with very large cells with nuclear and cytoplasmic inclusions. So it can cause a cytoplasmic inclusion, but it can also cause nuclear inclusions. And we also detected the immunohistochemistry. This is our antibody, and you can see it gives a very nice positivity for CMV. However, I have to say that CMV inclusions are not a common finding in the biopsies, at least in the biopsies we see, that you see a frank inclusion, not CMV nephropathy, not uncommon. The actual frank viral inclusions are not that common. Usually CMV patients present with edema and a lot of plasma cell infiltrate, and this is, usually goes with CMV infection, even if you don't see the viral inclusion. So don't count on suspecting CMV nephropathy only on the presence that you cannot see the classic CMV inclusions because they are not that common. The other type of infection, which is quite rare, is adenovirus infection. Now, these um, uh, pictures are from Falker. They, they have the immunohistochemistry antibody for adenovirus, as you can see. This is also from UNC uh, lab. And uh, look here. This is positive for adenovirus. Adenovirus causes a markedly hemorrhagic kidney. It can, it can cause a lot of interstitial hemorrhage, but also can cause inclusions, these types of inclusions, which can also overlap with polyomavirus and a lot of edema and plasma cells, as you can see. But usually the hallmark or what can make you suspect adeno infection is uh, the hemorrhage. However, it's extremely rare and only few cases are reported. Okay, we're Egyptians, so I cannot really discuss any form of viral infections without discussing HCV. So, you know that uh, this is the most frequent glomerular lesion, which is associated with chronic HCV infection in uh, uh, renal allografts, is recurrent or de novo MPGN with or without mixed cryoglobulinemia. We also see de novo membranous glomerulopathy. Um, I always like to stress that this is pre the phospholipase uh, 2 era. But also HCV infection can cause PTLZ, and we've seen few cases of very chronic HCV infection. Patients presented with PTLZ 15 years and 12 years post transplant. What about in the new DEA era? Okay, 
we still don't know whether these, these patients are going to develop also PTLD uh, or not, since now most of our patients uh, receive their treatments. EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, of course, we know that the main problem is that it causes PTLD. This is a patient with post-transplant proliferative disorder, and this patient was actually three years post-transplant, and he was EBV positive, as you can see. However, we know now that not all patients are EBV positive and not all patients present in the early post-transplant period and that we have PTLD 20 years post-transplant EBV negative and it's been reported. The early PTLD is four stages and only the fourth stage is a frank lymphoma where pathologists can detect it easily. However, the first three stages, actually the first two stages is a polyclonal infiltrate so you cannot even detect it by immunohistochemistry. And the second stage where you get monoclonal infiltrate, again, it's an innocent infiltrate. Diagnosis of PTLD is not easy on, on, on the biopsy, it requires a very high suspicion and requires very high clinical correlation between the EBV status, between what you're seeing in the biopsy, and between the clinical, uh, in general, the clinical status of the patient. So can we be missing cases? It's a possibility. Can we be overdiagnosing cases? It's also a possibility. This is not a straightforward entity, in the first three stages. The frank ones are frank enough, but the first three stages of uh, a PTLD, it's a basically an infoproliferative disease. It's not that easy to detect. PTLD, as I said, occurs in up to 20% of pediatric organ recipients, but less than 1% in others. So they're more common in pediatrics. Most PTLD reflects Epstein-Barr infection of B lymphocytes, but T cell, NK cell, null cell, and EBV negative forms also occur. The main risk factors are primary EBV infection, CMV donor recipient, uh, pseudostatus mismatch, T cell depletion, younger age in children, older age in adults, and intensity of immunosuppression. As I mentioned, PTLD presents at any time post transplant with a bimodal pattern of onset in the first year and then beyond five to seven years. So it has a bimodal peak of interest in transplant. And I know most of us, five and seven years post-transplant, this entity drops out of our differential diagnosis. And since we're discussing PTLD, this will take us to post-transplant malignancy. And in kidney transplant recipients, in general, the incidence of cancer is generally increased two to threefold compared with the general population. We know this. And you know that the increased cancer risk is not spread evenly over all types of malignancies. Some malignancies are not increased like breast, prostate, ovarian, brain, and cervical, but others are increased substantially like lung, colon, liver, lymphomas, melanomas, and non-melanomas, and skin cancer. And as the same issue of infection, immunosuppression is considered the most important risk factor as it decreases the immunological control of the oncogenic viral infection and cancer immunosurveillance in general. So this is the risk factors of post-transplant malignancies. I'm going to get into details. You know them better uh, than me. And this is the immunosuppressive drugs and their capacity of oncogenesis. Depends on CNIs, ASAs, MMF, mTOR inhibitors. Everyone works on a different uh, uh, analog. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the contributive effect of the different immunosuppressive agents that, uh, that it's not well established at this time. So we don't know the cumulative effect of each one. So the messages are that concurrent infections and super infections are not uncommon. So your patient might have done more than one infection. Don't only count on a urine analysis. Don't only count on a blood PCR. You might be surprised. You might find something else in the patient. Infection and rejection can occur together. This is not something rare or something uncommon or something only which is present in the cases. This is something which we see commonly in our patients and any form of rejection. So always remember this. Oncogenic viral infections will lead to malignancies, which is one of the most common causes of death in kidney transplant recipients. And hence, it's all related to immunosuppression. So try to avoid what can be avoided for the sake of the patient's survival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hussam. It is a very wonderful presentation, excellent presentation. I would like to, just before starting the discussion, 
I, I, I like to invite Professor Maya Hasabala. I can't hear she, anything. Uh, you, is this, you, is this you, only me? You heard me, Dr. Halawa? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, okay. Uh, you heard me well. Yeah. Okay. So I, I would like to invite Professor Maya Hasabala just to uh, welcome and the great. I can't hear anything. Professor Wissam Ismail uh, for the efforts she done. Uh, 15 webinars through three months. It is a great job done by Professor Hussam. So, Professor May. Uh, well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. And, of course, uh, Hussam is a very uh, dear friend of me. And uh, she has been doing, actually, it's a course. It's a whole course, which can... Uh, go to and find most of the questions you can uh, ever think about in pathology as related to the kidney. So uh, uh, thank you very much, Sam, for your persistence and for your very informative uh, lectures. And uh, I, I'm sure this is going to be very useful for everybody, for the young ones, for the uh, senior professors, for everybody, because Pathology is very important and, and a lot of us really are not uh, as good at it. So what you have done is a really great help to nephrologists. And you are a nephrologist actually with them, so I consider you so. So thank you very much. So thank Professor, you much. Professor May, uh, uh, I suggested that the SNT should congratulate Professor Wissam during the coming conference because she did a very nice job through uh, from the 20s of March up to this moment, 15 sessions, almost 30 hours. So it is- I can't hear anything. It is Hello? a hard job. Uh, Dr. Hussam, I'm- do, do you hear me, everybody? Or-, or Yes. Or is it... Yes, 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 yes. yes. So something the wrong with, with the Wissam's mic? Yes, or, yes, or... yes. Uh, I think Professor Halawa just write to Dr. Wissam to uh, re-upload herself, to re-enter. So to uh, log out and log in again, because it seems that she has uh, so, uh, some problem in her connection. You can write to, to in the chat yeah, to yeah. her. Yes, please. So to, to start the discussion, it is a very interesting presentation, all presentation, very, very smart way for discussing viral affection of the graft. Uh, I would like to congratulate Professor Ahmed Halawa for his uh, special issue of infection and transplantation that was published in the Journal of Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation. It's a very nice um, source for infection post transplantation. And uh, I remind him by his promise that he will present in a special webinar infections transmitted by the donor. So we are waiting the, the date after Pilgrimism, inshallah. Um, uh, one of the important messages that Professor Rassam discussed is PK virus. She clearly demonstrated the rule of pathology. Pathology is the best way for diagnosis of PK or polyuma virus nephropathy, as Professor Rassam mentioned. And I'd like to just to add, the, the process starts with viruria, virus and urine, then viremia, then uh, tissue uh, insult. So if we uh, follow the patients and uh, uh, recommended by the international authorities, if the patient presents with graft dysfunction to put in mind BK or bulyuma virus in differential diagnosis, this will help a lot, especially in the era of tacrolimus, because tacrolimus is uh, very serious. Tacrolimus plus mycophenolic acid drugs are associated with high risk of bulyuma virus and the virus nephropathy, because it seems that acrylomus inhibits T cell against TBK, and this is differential to cyclosporin. And one of very interesting point, and I would like to ask Dr. Halawa about this point, do you have cases of, of failed graft associated with bulyuma? Because up to this moment, if we have a graft failed because of bulyuma, and then we think of retransplantation, the advice is just to follow the viral load in the blood. If viral load disappears in the blood, this means that the disease the, we can go for the second transplant even without graft nephrectomy. Graft nephrectomy is still 
debatable, but we can do graft retransplantation if the BCR in the blood is negative. Uh, the, I, and I think Professor Hussam clarified the role of decoy cell uh, so much. I learned it from my stay with uh, Professor Helmut Rinke since, since 10 years that if there is any inclusion in the tissues, he automatically stains immunohistochemical staining for both BK, CMV, and the adenovirus. And at the end of the day, he has electromicroscope as well. Uh, because electromicroscope can clarify the inclusion present and uh, can specify the diagnosis. Uh, and I think viral infection are so enormous because we can read case reports uh, about the herbaceous simplex associated. The last point I want to, to say in this long commentary is that some immune suppressive drugs have a privilege like immature inhibitors. Immature inhibitors have broad some anti-CMV anti, anti effect. And this is a privilege that was shown in randomized controlled trials. And I think this is one of the uh, advantages of immature inhibitor. It reduced the risk of CMV and uh, probably uh, polyoma virus as well. These are my comments. And then I'm leaving the floor for the discussion. And we are going to start with Professor Halau. Uh, will you keep me uh, at the end? Okay. Because I have many comments here. Okay. So we can start with, uh, with my colleagues. To, to yes. Make... Dr. Alina. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Alina. Dr. Mohammed. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Mohammed, uh, thank you so much, Professor Wissam, for this elegant uh, presentation. Uh, actually, the, uh, I have three issues. يعني أنا هقولهم لك واحد ولا الثاني كده وعشان تحسن ما إيه. Keep in English, ما أبطر محمد. Keep in English. أنت حتى عليا بلينا بس غلين إنجليزي. First issue, uh, طبعا the line of demarcation between BVN only and BVN with uh, concomitant acute rejection is very vital for the clinician because the treatment is completely different. One, we will minimize immune suppression. Uh, the other we will uh, intensify or cautiously will add some anti rejection treatment. So you do you think uh, the presence of tubulitis uh, in an area nearby uh, the tubular cytopathic viral included uh, cells is different from tubulitis far away from the tubule uh, with the viral inclusion? And does it make any difference for a patient who has tubulitis in an area far away from the SV40 positive uh, cross-sectional area, that's the first uh, issue. The second issue, sometimes clinical pathologically, we, we might face a situation that the patient has rising creatinine, uh, PCR for BK is negative, uh, but un, uh, unexpectedly we find SV40 is positive. So creatinine is high, PCR is uh, negative, and then the comment of the biopsy come in certain centers doing SV40 routine, it is positive. Uh, so we are not sure is it really a true infection and the sensitivity of the BCR is not good or it is something different. In the same line, sometimes uh, the patient might have BCR positive, keratin is rising, and the biopsy is normal. Yani, there is no any uh, histopathological finding for uh, SV40 or uh, viral inclusion in the histology. The last one uh, that I would like to know uh, the, the, the BANF classification for uh, the BK nephropathy. Do you think it is only eliminated the inter-observer variability without an impact on the clinical outcome or it translates also to clinical outcome? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, this is very important questions. Thank oh. you, Dr. Muhammad. Okay, I'll answer the, the last one first. Uh, yes, it did both actually. It eliminated the inter-observer reproducibility because it basically counted on two factors on two factors, on two denominators, which are easy to, uh, more or less easy to uh, uh, evaluate. The SV40 positive nuclei translated into the PVL or the fiber load and the presence of interstitial fibrosis. It did not include anything else, nor inflammation, nor um, uh, any other uh, criteria. So make it simple and uh, clear. So intervariable reproducibility within this classification is very good. Inter-observer reproducibility, sorry. But the main factor for this classification and why it stayed almost more than 10 years, 
or almost 10 years still, it showed up was the clinical outcome. And this was the whole factor. And I remember that we had in the meetings and in the smaller meetings for this committee, a lot of fight about PVL1 being only 1% and that it's really nothing and it's negligible and should not be included and so on. But actually evidence-based later on have showed that, no, it was, it was important. So it does have an important clinical impact. It seems like a bit of a loose classification. Um, um, I, I know it's not such a user-friendly for class two, but it uh, outlines the two most important factors, how much viral replication you have in the biopsy and versus how much fibrosis you have. So yes, of course, it reflects the clinical impact. And it so may, guide, may guide us not to over suppress the patients. Uh, because it, it improved the, uh, uh, the diagnostic uh, capacity because, as you know, the problems in serology and in the urine. So if we increase the sensitivity of the tissues by considering the very minimal uh, CV, uh, SV40 positive um, uh, infiltration, this will guide us if the patient has a stubble graft not to oversuppress this patient. I think it's very nice. Okay, for the second question, uh, the differences between uh, the PCR and the SV40 staining. Uh, okay, I can't comment on immunostochemical techniques of other centers, of course, but we will assume that this is a, a solid validated uh, test. If you have a negative PCR, and uh, I'm not sure about the sensitivity of the PCRs, but they're usually quite sensitive. I mean, we never face problems basically of a PCR which is not sensitive, especially in viruses. But if you have positive nuclei in the tissue and a negative PCR, then there are two things to do. First one is that you really need the urine cytology with the coi cell. If this patient has viral replication and there is a problem with the PCR, it will show in his urine. And then this one is, is the least test with the least fallacies. The second thing is that you, would, you can consider that this is JC, it's not BK. And then your patient rising creatinine is for another reason. And we had a case like this. I had a case like this. The patient had, but the nuclei were in the, in the medulla, within the cortical medullary junction. And it was positive, but it was only a PVL1 actually. And the patient's PCR was completely negative. And the patient had an ADMR, her C4D was positive. So... Um, when the PCR was negative, we had concluded that this patient actually and her, and her urine cytology showed very few decoy cells. So this was not a sign of an active uh, PVN going on. So we actually concluded that this GC. So this is one scenario. I have the a question to you, Professor Sam here. Uh, how, how much or how frequent do you find BK in nephropathy in the tissues? Is it frequent? Because uh, I feel that uh, uh, bulyoma virus nephropathy is different from country to country. This is why we should do our best to have our registry for volume virus affection in Egyptian patients because we use tacrylomas and the microfinite mofetel and it's seldom to diagnose volume virus nephropathy in our cases. We, okay. Yes. What is I, I, your, your experience? Do you find a lot of cases? No, we don't. But yes. in order for you and I to come with such a sentence, we need to do SV40 routinely. Oh. We now we do SV40 upon suspicion. Okay, so if I suspect a nucleus, then maybe another pathologist is not going to suspect it. It's our own. Um, but on suspicion, up. on suspicion, how frequent do you diagnose human Not it's frequent. Not. And uh, moreover, uh, we have an experience here. We requested uh, the BCR. 400 cases PCR for quantitative for both volume virus and the JC virus and the, uh, the, the uh, percentage of the cases volume or uh, JC in the blood zero out of 100 cases. So it seems that it is different from country to country. Um, We've done a study and it's published yes. in transplant infectious diseases um, um, uh, three or four years back. And it was also on 111 uh, patients with the PCR. And we had out of the 111, around 13 patients with a positive PVM in, um, in the biopsy and around 20 with presentive uh, PN. They had only high PCR, but no evidence of uh, PVN in the biopsy. However, again, uh, 
yes, I can agree with you, and not because we have different genes or it's environmental. I think it's because we have a different culture and socioeconomic yes. status. Okay. So, yes, we tend to have more non-compliance and more rejection rather than, and this is, this is, an, this is a virus which, uh, virus which results from high, uh, a very compliant, uh, intensive immunosuppression. Uh, but we also get, give a lot of anti-rejection treatment of induction. We can have um, a high rate of uh, malignancy. And we need to consider that we do have a percentage of cases which are probably missed or not uh, biopsied. I'm but expecting I, if we apply SV40 routine. Uh, we will test, find a bit yes. more, but not up to what yeah. is public. I agree. And but if we, we, can, if we, look we can at be the, surprised. Yes, if we look at the cortex and the medulla, just 1% or less than 1%, I think it will reduce the false negative results that we uh, were confronted with. Okay, that's the answer of the second, uh, of the second uh, the point, uh, yes. the part of the second question for Dr. Muhammad. Rejection is. is if you have a PCR positive and a negative biopsy, then you need to consider that uh, a, a, either some, there's something wrong with the technique, with the IHC technique, and it needs to be repeated, or uh, that you don't have a PVN. A PC, yes. positive PCR does not equal a polyomavirus nephropathy. And this is the advantage of positive why, serology. This is the advantage of positive serology. It is this a, is why, this is why SV40, yes. SV40 is, um, uh, is a, the gold standard for diagnosis. It's not the PCR. And this is why we say patients with a positive PCR are a presumptive PVN. Yes, you're allowed to manage on a presumptive PVN if you want. But at the end of the day, a definitive PVN is the one on uh, biopsy. So yes, of course, you can have a, a high PCR and a negative biopsy. If you allow me, Professor Hussam, for this point, because centers who uh, recommended doing serial PCR testing for the blood for uh, virus just to pick up positive serology, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to wait until the tissue is affected because vi viremia precedes uh, viral nephropathy. So okay. if I have viremia, I, yes. I, I'm going to reduce immune suppression to avoid the, exactly. yes, the tissue. That's why we're saying with presumi. Okay. And for the cost effective and for people not to panic, um, it is either, um, uh, it's even in the guidelines that it's either you can do the PCR or you can screen by decoy uh, cells in urine. And again, the decoy, the increasing numbers of decoy cells will reflect that you have an increasing viral replication and increasing viremia, and you need to do something about your patient. Uh, the, first, uh, the first question, Dr. Muhammad, about rejection, yes. and is it enough to have tubulitis away from uh, the, it is enough for suspicion, yes. And, if, enough. We, and if, we, if the diagnosis at the end of the day, combination of bulioma virus and rejection, the treatment is IVIG. The, 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 the best recommended treatment is to use IVIG uh, uh, instead of steroid and others because this will help for rejection and help for bulimia virus as well. The problem is treatment of bulimia virus up to this moment, it is, there is no solid, the only solid base is to reduce immune suppression. And I had the, the, the chance to participate in one of the research. I didn't do anything in this research, but I attended the era, so they added my name uh, to a study for penilones uh, to, to, uh, uh, as a prophylaxis against the BK virus. But after uh, my uh, coming uh, back to Egypt, they did randomized control study and they found penilones has nothing to protect against the BK. Penilone is not effective for treatment to BK. Even leflunomide is not good. So the only best uh, uh, way is to reduce immune suppressive state for patients with bulimia virus. But if it's combined with rejection, treatment, I think the best way is to give IVIG. Dr. Okay, uh, Mohammed is still had a, a point. Let, yes. Let me. Um, no, Professor Seven, for that, it's okay. No, okay. I was going to take uh, just a question from the audience. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Point one, Dr. Hani Mansour, any clinical implications of different types of inclusion bodies? No. No, there are no oh. clinical. Are, this is just a morphological. Um, yeah. I diagnostic book. And another question in the chat. I, I think there is an, uh, other questions. There is other question. Yes, please go ahead. Abo. Um, 
two percent in his MBD thesis. No, uh, someone is saying that okay. in the MBD thesis, nephropathy. Professor Wassam, uh, yeah, you just mentioned the uh, early uh, BK nephropathy early, maybe uh, the histological finding might be uh, absent uh, and also late. So the focality uh, of the lesion secondary to BK virus infection, it might uh, explain the situation of positive uh, PCR with high creatinine and still the area in the biopsy may be not affected or still early or late. Uh, am I right? Uh, you're right theoretically, but uh, I like to be more uh, practical and down to earth. If I have a patient with a rising serum creatinine due to PVN, then I need to, re to see a histology reflecting this disease. Dr. Anagwa? Uh, if, if you're doing it as a screening method, and th this is a different story. If the patient has a mild renal impairment, and it's, it's, uh, then yes, then we can consider that it could be in the medulla, that it could be only a single nucleus. But a patient with a rising clear, uh, serum creatinine, then I need really a florid, to, in order to link it to PVN, then I need a florid uh, acrosis. And he could have a high PCR and have another thing going on within his kidney causing his rising creatinine. Do so we need to be one? more uh, open, yes. Great thank you, Dr. Wissam, for all your efforts. Uh, you. I'd like to ask uh, two questions. First one, uh, polyomavirus is normally dormant in tubular and uh, urocellular cells. Yes, yes. And Salute. when reactivation occurs, polyomavirus nephropathy starts to occur and uh, uh, starts to occur. So how can I consider uh, polyomavirus in class one? Uh, bulioma virus nephropathy with just only positive uh, SV40 uh, in immunohistochemistry and no viral inclusions and no tubular injury. Because uh, SV40 is not going to detect the latent virus. Uh, the detection is basically based, uh, the viral inclusions actually, or the detection is based on the viral replication. The more virus you, can, you have, then you're going to detect it. But, so, in, class one, but in class one, no viral inclusions. But the virus is replicating in the nucleus. Oh. Yeah, Can you it happen? And the difference, yes, so that yes. it, let's say, for example, that you will develop, for example, just an example to simplify things for you, that you're going to develop a, a nuclear inclusion when the virus is replicating around 20,000 virions, for example. But before that, you're not going to see a histological nuclear inclusion. But the virus is replicating. Okay. I want to say, how can I differentiate it from normal? No, that's normal. not normal. Normal is negative. Should be negative. Should be normal negative. Normal is negative. Yes. Normal is negative. Should be a negative in the tissue. A latent infection means an inactive infection. It means that you don't have viral replication. Once the virus starts replicating, then you have a viral replication. Uh, just to assure <laughs> Dr. Nagwa. Dr. Nagwa. Without inclusions, Dr. Anagwa, Dr. Anagwa, yes. it can happen without frank, easy to see inclusions. Eventually, yes. these are going to develop into the frank, large inclusions you see. Dr. Anagwa, yes. do you hear me, Dr. Anagwa? Yes, yes, I hear you. The yes. steps of infection it starts, the virus is present in almost in more than 70 percent of population in immune, in immune competent persons. So the yes. presence of vi viruria and then viremia and lastly nephropathy. The presence of SCV40 within the tissues, this means that the viral is replicated, is active. Uh, yes. So, so if, whenever SCV40 is positive in renal tissues, this means that we, we are uh, in the replicative phase. So we should respect uh, the class one volume of virus yes. nephropathy. Yes, my second the small question. Uh, regarding adenovirus inclusions, it is uh, differential diagnosis of in, 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 uh, inclusions in uh, tubular cells. First one, uh, polyoma, second, the CMV, third, uh, adenovirus. Adenovirus, is it uh, available adenovirus immunoperoxidase? Number yeah. two, uh, to what extent uh, the prevalence of adenovirus nephropathy in, in general population? Okay, in my center and where I work, no, adenovirus IHC is not available. I don't know if it's available anywhere else in Egypt, but I, um, I have no news uh, of that. It is available and at Brigham, at Brigham, I was a Helmut Rinke group. Yes. This yes. Is routine, a routine immunochemical for CMV. And it's a routine immunochemical for us. We do, yeah. we have SV40 and CMV. 
but we don't have adeno because it's very rare. Okay. Very rare. Yes, it's a very rare viral infection, so we don't have adeno. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to add a statement because in the in the past era, uh, we are accustomed to say CMV is cytoplasmic, uh, B, BK or polymovirus is intranuclear, <laughs> adeno is both. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't yes. take this as a, a, a salient feature of viral infection, and the immunohistochemical is mandatory to say uh, this is not as an adding point. Uh, Dr. Yasser Abhamid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. Dr. Yasser Abhamid. Hello. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Professor Hussain, for this highly elegant talk as usual. Okay, uh, my question about uh, COVID-19 oh. and your information about having direct effect, direct pathological effect in renal allograft, any please? Um, yes, uh, what, but it's not, a, well, I haven't seen uh, cases. We had two uh, suspected cases. It's known yes. that it, it aggravates the rejection process and uh, some pathologists uh, have detected them in the porocytes with other pathologists doubting the, <laughs> the, 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 whether these are, re, is, are really the virus. Um, yes. uh, there is uh, one lab in, uh, in the States, uh, Arcana Laboratories. They already developed an immunohistochemistry marker for uh, COVID and they uh, stain other cases. But mm -hmm. um, we haven't seen anything uh, yet uh, in a positive uh, What we know for, with COVID for sure is that it aggravates the original disease. So, for example, in native uh, kidneys, if the patient is vasculitic, anti-GBM, um, ANCAS, or anything, patients present with aggressive uh, chrysanthic uh, forms. It presents with interstitial nephritis. Yes, it aggravates the original disease out of the immune response it creates, most probably, uh, for some reason or another. And in, uh, in transplant patients, yes, some patients have presented, but with the regular rejection, nothing more. And in what, what's been reported in native biopsies as well has been an interstitial nephritis. And we just had a case of an acute tubular injury with hemolysis associated. This one was in uh, here, I've just seen it last week. And this patient was also uh, COVID. But other than that, this is all what we know. Apart, of course, from the post-mortem study with, with the reported thrombotic microangiopathy from China. But so far, this, but in transplant, okay. nothing specific other than it would aggravate, it would precipitate rejection. This is, this is the, the, the reason of my question. It's effect of rejection. Can we uh, expect to have something like CMV? For example, in the future, to be discovered in the future, of have of aggravated rejection, or something like this? We know, we, we know for a fact that any form of infection can trigger rejection. And mm -hmm. this is why we know that it's common to see uh, rejection processes together with viral infections. It's commonly mm -hmm. described as polyoma because this is the one which is pathology-based. But if the patient has any other form of infection which triggered his rejection process, of course, because at the end of the day, when you have an infection, any form of infection, bacterial, viral, you trigger it, but specifically viral because you trigger an, uh, an immune response, which is eventually going to lead to a rejection process. As a part of general infection. But for COVID, because it is a respiratory infectious disease with pneumonia, I'm not going to take care of the rejection at all. We, if we have COVID suspicious, we reduce antiproliferative, and if there is pneumonia, we, re we cut down all antiproliferative, and the but you know that we yes. have more, more, more you, evidence that it's you, more of a systemic okay. viral disease actually. Are you, are you, and if the patient got to the uh, to the stage of a moderate disease with it, with an early immune mounting an immune response, then this is what you're going to see. And we have reported cases of AKI, which is yes. Uh, yes. So this is what? also not related to the uh, pneumonia because they are interstitial nephritis. Oh. And some of them have hemolysis. So, and you have an element of micro um, angiopathy as well. And so, collapsing also collapsing glomerulopathy. And collapsing glomerulopathy, of course. I was asking. So, yes. We still don't know a lot about uh, this viral infection. This is what has been reported within uh, the community so far. But in the graft, it is still we are waiting further studies to assess the direct effect of the COVID there is, on the graft. Uh, there is a hash. There is yes, sir. There is a hashtag on Twitter. 
uh, by Tiffany uh, from uh, Arcana Laboratories, and they're collecting all uh, possible oh. COVID uh, cases, and they they are already uh, reporting, and it's it's going on. So okay. some follow that's up. great. Not not all patients having a severe pneumonia. Some having okay. a very mild disease, and yeah, we are to look for the graph. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Professor. You. Thank you, Professor, Professor Riyad Saeed. Yes. مساء الخير. مساء الفل يا باشا. Uh, Dr. Wissam, shukran jazeelan ala al-muhadra al-qayyima as usual. Now, really, my question about what you mentioned about CMV nephritis, interstitial nephritis, and CMV in general. We don't really see much CMV in our area here simply because we don't use induction. Did you notice a relation between what you mentioned as CMV in general and CMV nephritis? Any patient who received induction? therapy, I, uh, ATG, for example. Secondly, if there is the prophylaxis doesn't really make less chances for such infections. Thank you. Yeah. I think Hussein can answer this question better than me. You know, I never actually look back to see, and when I have a biopsy suggestive of CMV, whether this patient has an induction or not, because usually, by the way, these are not early cases. So uh, these are usually late presentations or patients who have been transplanted for two or three or five years. And we do see MV, uh, we do see uh, also CMV in them. So I usually don't get the history of um, an induction uh, or not. And um, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I can't comment on the prophylaxis whether it uh, makes Dr. Difference. Hussain, what do you think? The, the use of antibodies, sure, it will increase the risk of, CM, of CMV. Uh, and here, our experience at Urology and Nephrology Center, Mansoura, we are f from a school since uh, many time, since a long time, we didn't adopt the policy of prophylaxis. But we faced bad pneumonias in, ser in, in case series. This is why we, we, we accustomed to use uh, valacyclovir, uh, valacyclovir, and valgancyclovir for high risk patients for uh, positive to negative, the positive donor to receive a negative, we use valgancyclovir. For other positive recipient, we use valacyclovir routine for three months. And if the patient is treated with um, uh, rejection by using antibody therapeutics, it, it is suggested to give um, uh, further uh, prophylaxis for these patients. But uh, for the graft, we didn't find in the biopsies data refer the, uh, referring to the CMEV uh, glomerulitis or CMEV vasculitis or interstitial nephritis in the graft. We don't, we don't have routine immunohistochemical staining at our center. And um, uh, Sam, do you, do you do it routine or when you find the inclusions in the, in the biopsy? Uh, the CMV? Yes. Or the uh, uh, no, when uh, when I suspect, it. Yes. not only well, the inclusions because well, uh, like I said it causes edema, and edema and a plasma cell infiltrate is um, is a direct uh, um, a stimulus to do a viral profile. How many cases you diagnose MEV kidney affection um, by strength uh, viral inclusion? Very little. Yes. yes. Very few. Very little. Very few. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, very really little. very few. Yes. Yeah. It yes. is not common as well. Professor Riyad, do you want to add uh, uh, Just point? another comment about the yes. adenovirus. Yes, you know, uh, I'm sure with the, the biopsy is classic when you see hemorrhage in the biopsy. I understand also usually uh, hemorrhagic cystitis will be part of the presentation oh. uh, with the adenovirus infection uh, that leads also to uh, kidney involvement in the graft. What do you think about this? Um, well, it causes much more, of course, adenoviruses in general are very common, but we're talking about adenovirus nephropathy. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I haven't heard about a concurrent case, but it, co it definitely causes hemorrhagic cystitis much more frequent than it can cause adenovirus nephropathy. Okay. Hussein, what do you think? I don't have a good Except experience. If anyone, yeah, if anyone else have seen a case with concurrent hemorrhagic cystitis. I read in literature, I don't know. Ahmed is yes. the... 
raising his hand. Dr. Ahmed. Actually, it was started transplantation in 1993. I haven't seen a single case. <laughs> yeah, it's extremely rare, yes. And the first time to hear about it is from you today. <laughs> <laughs> so very nice comment, Dr. Ahmed. It's very nice. Okay, well, but, thank you but, very much, really. It, it may be because you don't follow, you don't do diagnosis, you don't do routine immunohistochemical staining. No, 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 it's really, no. Yeah. no. This one is <laughs> extremely rare by everybody knows. And this okay. is why the marker is not widely available. We all have polyoma and CMV, whether with the variable um, incidences in different countries, but we know these viruses exist and we can have patients with them. But I don't know, I don't think any renal pathologists have seen more than one or two cases. Of I, read them in, I read them very nice in the, in the, in the journals. Adeno and herpes simplex, and there is some speculation about Zika virus. All these are very nice for MD nephrology. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, that's unfair. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this, is, this is unfair to be in the exam. Uh, yes, it is completely unfair, and it's not my policy. But you can find some professor who like these points. <laughs> professor Faisal? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Usama, I enjoy again your talk very much. You, it's very clear and to the point. Still, there's, this subject is very important for the nephrologist because there are many, uh, uh, many issues is not solved yet, even with the advanced uh, transplantation. Mm -hmm. Things like the rule of the uh, uh, changing the immunosuppression drug in treatment uh bk virus and which drug we are going to choose and uh, are we going to if the patient develop uh, graft nephropathy and and he already had the uh, end stage renal disease are we going to nephrectomize the kidney because of the tissue and inclusions of the bk virus or not uh, uh what is the rule of uh, mtor management should we remove it to, uh, should we change it to uh, Eberolomas uh, because it will help also in overcome uh, the polyoma? Or uh, what's the rule of the uh, lifunamide? Either it can help also to overcome the problem of uh, the immune suppression if we change mTOR to lifunamide or change to Eberolomas. So there are many issues. We still going on. I'm, I'm sure that some policy in some places, uh, they should wait uh, and maybe sh should have uh, nephrectomy before retransplanting such a patient. And for BTLD also, it is still almost the same. We have to wait probably one and a half years to two years and the patient should be cleared completely. We are not going only to to, to, to wait till the lymphoma subsides. So still there are many issues regarding this subject, which is very important. And you, you from the pathological point of view, you tackle every single point. Excellent. Still our rules as a nephrologist is still, it's open for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Faisal, very much. And this is why, um, as you say, we have so many issues and so many uncovered things and so, if we can try as a transplantation society to work on the prevention or catching um, um, the disease, something like PVN, and save ourselves all the hassle of what's going to come on later by trying to implement more routine investigations like routine as we fought on biopsies, like screening um, the cytology for uh, the coi cells and be, being able to pick the, the patient. Definitely, this is going to um, help us a lot till we can figure out someday what uh, will be more advanced or maybe more newer uh, regimens uh, with it. And this, this was mainly uh, the direction that in, within these issues of malignancy and viral infections, we really need to target the prevention and the early, uh, to catch them early before uh, we, are, uh, we are into the problem. But of course, as you say, some of the patients were faced with the situation. And yes, we still have all of these issues. Thank you very much for your comment. Dr. Said is raising I like to, I would like to refer to the very nice uh, review article about the, the uh, volume of virus in NDT. It is still in press. And I think it was published in the, in the March or February 
and this very nice review article discussing many points, especially the graft nephrectomy, the role of graft nephrectomy. It is still very debatable. But uh, the, the undebatable issue, we, we shouldn't retransplant if there is positive viremia. Uh, so if there is negative viremia, we can, we can proceed for retransplantation. To do uh, uh, graft nephrectomy or not, there is a case, uh, a cohort study showing that graft nephrectomy reduces uh, BK, but up to this moment, it is a debatable issue. And the most important is to look at the serology. And I think, uh, as, I, as you mentioned, Professor Faisal, a lot of debate are there, how to treat, how to tackle. And I think the best way is early diagnosis. It's early diagnosis because early diagnosis will allow us to reduce immune suppression uh, and instead of uh, uh, facing full bloom nephropathy, which is untreated uh, disease. Dr. Saeed Khamis. Dr. Mohammed Saeed, Lina, da amla le mushkil. Thank you, thank you, Professor Usam, for this elegant lecture. Uh, my question, uh, my question, uh, I think mainly to Professor Faisal, and uh, may you will help in the answer, inshallah. Uh, Professor Faisal, uh, if you remember the, the uh, boring story of this uh, cadaveric uh, donor who had uh, rabies and uh, transplanted his kidneys to two recipient, two young recipient, and the two young recipient died already at that moment. Uh, regarding the Gulf area uh, adopting the cadaveric program, uh, did you since did you uh, uh, include the screening for rabies, vi rabies virus uh, as a routine for the donor? Second, uh, can you summarize your uh, experience regarding the dengue fever, which was prevalent maybe 10 years back in some cities in the, in the kingdom regarding the transplant issue? Thank you, sir. Father, I, I unmute yourself, please, Dr. Rafis. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, the rabies is one of the cases which is being presented even up to WHO. And uh, the, the disease was from Kuwait, and uh, mostly all the patients who received the graft was, died because of the rabies. Most of them, liver and, and kidney and, uh, uh, and yeah. heart, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it makes us, if there is a history, there is, uh, because that donor, especially he was six months in his country and he returned back to Kuwait, and then uh, he got the brain death and then harvested at that time. Yeah. So no, no one know about the past history. But there is, if there is any past history, we should check for that. If, if either, either it give us lessons, not only us, it give all the community that rabies, uh, one of the things which we should investigate for the deceased, do for the deceased donor as well. Uh, this is uh, uh, important. About dingue fever, uh, dingue is, is a very dangerous. We we have it in you know long time back. Now yeah. it's very rare to have it in the kingdom here. Very rare. It's, yet we can have uh, in, in a healthy individual uh, dingue, uh, and if there is history of uh, dingue fever on admission to the hostel, we check for that because you know one of the things is that if you have hemorrhagic fever with the dingue, it's very dangerous and usually you don't take even uh, that uh, donor considered him as the suitable donor to take from him organ. So usually yeah. it is hemorrhagic, it will affect the kidney, it will affect everything. So we consider, we defer such uh, organ from the dingue fever uh, donor. Okay, I, thank I, you, I, I think the point raised by Professor Said is very important. Infection is different from area to area. And it is impossible to screen for all infections in all communities. So each community in the world uh, determines the types of infection that they are going to spotlight and highlight them. So it is completely variable from place to place. And I think Professor Halal will give a comment about this point uh, in his commentaries. Dr. Yes, actually. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, um, actually, uh, we had many mortalities from donors who died, or actually the recipient died because of unknown disease affecting the donor, which was not detected. Donor transmitted disease, something like rabies, something like some funny and rare organism. 
But the problem is we cannot screen every single donor, you know, for Impossible. all these Yes. Yeah, because you know it is a you know it's a exhaustive list of organisms, exhaustive list of tests to do, and most of these tests are not done routinely, so it means it will be a delay. So if you have high index of suspicion, lucky enough, you know we have a, a similar donor to what Dr. Faisal had, uh, and the kidneys, uh, with, I think, were kidneys only offered to us, and we rejected the you know the kidney based on the past medical history. Uh, one of the centers accepted both kidneys and both patients died. And it happens every now and then, you know, it will never stop. But we cannot run screening of millions of, um, of, of organisms. Otherwise, you know, it won't be a program. But this has an impact on our practice as well. Like Dr. Fisher said, we consent the, 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 the recipients against any donor-related infection and possible death. This actually to protect us, and uh, this is part as well of the informed consent. But if you, if you have any suspicion, just do the test. Or for us, simply reject the kidney. Uh, yeah. Dr. Yasser? Dr. Yasser Mulla. Many thanks for the great presentation and for the great discussion as usual. I would say that I'm very lucky as I saw two cases of adenovirus nephropathy in the last 10 years, one at the Hammersmith Hospital and one at Edinburgh's hospital. Both of them were presented as posters in the ATC. But I fully agree, like, because I saw these two, I will never forget them. Uh, one of them presented as hemorrhagic cystitis, uh, as was already mentioned in the discussion. And the other one was fever of unknown focus or unknown etiology, and it, it was found on the biopsy. Uh, nothing much to add to what is already mentioned, but it might be whenever there is a discussion about such a thing, it might be worth sharing the different experience between different centers. So I would just say very briefly about experience from three different centers in less than two minutes. So I worked in Muscat Sultan Kabus University Hospital, where they do screening by the decoy cell urine cytology. They don't do the PCR. They don't routinely do the SV40 stain on the biopsy. I worked at the Hammersmith Hospital, and they do protocol biopsy, and it's routine for them to do the SV40 stain on all the biopsy. They don't do the BK virus PCR in the blood at all. And their justification for that is that they do the protocol biopsy with SV40 and they do it so frequent and they follow what's called TAC monotherapy after camp path induction. So they say, even if we detect the BK virus viremia, what are we going to do as the patient is already on TAC monotherapy with a target level of five to eight, which is relatively low in the immediate post-transplant period, which is a justified and a valid point. Whereas here, for example, at the Edinburgh Hospital in Cambridge, they don't do protocol biopsy and they do use the triple immune suppression following the bacilliximab induction for most cases. And that's why they do like a screening on a regular intervals with the BK virus PCR in the blood. And last point to talk about is that I saw a couple of native native kidneys in hematological patient post BMT post a heavy uh, oh, chemotherapy okay. for CLL who lost their native kidney because of BK virus nephropathy which was biopsy proven and again thank you so much for everyone thank you very much Dr. Yasser for this but very I'm nice comment uh, Dr. Mohammed Saeed uh, he wants to add uh, this is the last point uh, I did not have Professor a Professor Wassam, just only one point regarding um, uh, the renal allograft inflammatory profile. Uh, I think it is very similar between uh, TK nephropathy and uh, acute cellular rejection. Both of them, they might share a common pathway, especially some studies showed that the gene expression of patients that have concomitant BVN plus rejection is similar. So do you think that uh, there is a common pathway or something underlines both of them that make BK virus potentiate rejection? Uh, for that, it is only TCR uh, studied and mentioned with uh, BK, not other types of rejection? Probably. Yeah, these studies, I know these studies and they, there was, uh, the question was there and they, there was a high suggestion because of the similar uh, the similarity in the phenotypes of the same uh, inflammatory uh, cells. But again, this is a viral response of the immune system, so you would expect to have transtoxic T cells there and C3 as well. So it could be a valid point, and there's still a lot that we don't know. 
بروفيسور حلاوة No, very nice questions. Thank you. Professor Halawa. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So basically, I would like to start with the BK virus, the relation of BK virus and cancer. You know, um, there was a nice study from, uh, case reports actually from, from Oxford, where they stained uh, uh, oh. cancer blood uh, for uh, SV40. We found actually the area where the cancer is there, even still uh, with uh, uh, SV40. But the other non cancerous area was negative. Was negative, yes. So it could be an association or could be a causation. So even we couldn't prove it. And also the same with cancer prostate as well there is some accusation of BK virus and cancer prostate. But again, is it acquisition or association? It's still not known. Uh, regarding the decoy cells, we didn't do the decoy cells because actually decoy cells, if you look at it, you need to uh, have freshly, fresh urine sample and should be processed within two hours. So practically for us, it's quite difficult. And also, as you alluded, 27% uh, sensitivity, 100% uh, uh, specificity. The decoy, actually, the word decoy is basically describing cancer cell. So many uh, could be cancer cells, could be other viral inclusion, not necessarily BK. This is why we decided not to do the decoy cell. We rely mainly on urine PCR. Urine PCR, you know, when, whenever the patient comes to the clinic, urine PCR regularly is done. And this is an easy and uh, straightforward screening tool to identify BK virus early on before we we'll proceed to the dilemma of band classification you mentioned and BK nephropathy, which I will never understand. <laughs> 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 and once we detect the uh, BK virus, uh, PCR, you know, PCR for the BK virus in urine is positive, we reduce immunosuppression. And again, back to the professor's point, there is, there's no, there is no consensus. It's all about related to that degree of immunosuppression rather than a particular drug. So a heavily immunosuppressed patient will get BK virus. Less uh, immunosuppressed patient will get rejection, but they won't get uh, BK virus. So it's, um, it's a uh, catch-22, as you wish to say here. So it's, a, um, it's basically, so PCR uh, for us is easy, quick, and sensitive, uh, rather than decoy cells. But one size does not fit all because uh, other centers are relying on the coil cell. Maybe they have the facility to, uh, uh, to process the urine sample within two hours. Uh, the second thing I would like to mention regarding... Dr. Uh, Asadullah, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Asadullah sent a question about yes. hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic cystitis with adenovirus. How to diagnose? Uh, Dr. Osam. My hemorrhage. What diagnose, diagnostic test? Because <laughs> we diagnose a few cases with cyclophosphamide by hematuria. Sometimes it is, it is very bad hematuria that yeah. it can, can lead to uh, uh, diversion of the bladder, so uh, cystectomy and diversion. So it is serious disease. And this is one of, for within oncology, it is one of uh, oncology emergencies uh, with uh, cyclophosphamide. Uh, so, so you want to expect to see, um, he's okay. asking whether can we do it by urine cytology? No, yes. you're not going to expect to see uh, um, uh, viral inclusions uh, on uh, urine cytology. Not every viral infection sheds a transitional cell, like CMV. And also uh, a comment on what Dr. Halawa said, that the viral inclusions or the decoy cells, which look like malignant cells, they could be other viral inclusion or other malignant cells. No, no. Uh, malignant cells usually don't have viral inclusions, and if these are malignant cells, the pathologists will know that they are malignant cells. We say the four pathologists that they don't know that these are individual cells, and malignancies look, look different, and we can differentiate between atypical cells on their way to malignancies and between viral inclusions, and CMV patients do not have, you don't see the inclusions within uh, the urine uh, cytology. I don't know how you can uh, confirm for sure that this hemorrhagic cystitis is adeno-related. Maybe they do an immuno on it or maybe any other test. I have no experience with that, actually. 
for for the coil cell, as you mentioned during the presentation, Dr. Sam, uh, the, the negative predictive value is very high. This this will assure us if we are yes, if it's negative, it will be fine. If it's positive, we may uh, be in. Uh, it might be or might not. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Riyad Saeed raised his hand, so Dr. Riyad, and then to go uh, to come again to Professor Halaw. Dr. Riyad. Unmute yourself, Dr. Riyad. Dr. Ahmed, uh, okay. Okay, Dr. Ahmed. Yeah, regarding the APV uh, and PTLD, actually, APV negative. PTLD is associated with worse prognosis. Yes. So, uh, you know, we shouldn't be uh, delighted that, uh, you know, it's uh, EPV is negative and we got evidence of PTLD staying confirmed by histological finding. So it's associated with definitely worse prognosis. And the vast majority of PTLD actually are B cells rather than D T cells, yes. which is, you know, in, in contrast to the... Um, the rejection uh, process and the regular infection. The lymphoma in general population, yes. Yes, it always helps to, if that if you suspect to do a simple CD20, uh, and this is what we do in our suspected cases, and these are the cases that we've picked up. And the monoclonality is... Um, yes. Yes, a CD20 dominant infiltrate yeah. definitely should make you uh, suspect uh, PTLD. And uh, we said that EBV negative and it's not being delighted, but, uh, but don't, it's just we're mentioning it because people need to know that you can have PTLD even if you don't have EBV. Okay, Dr. Halawa. Thank you very much. No, no, uh, regarding urine sensitivity, because, you know, we're not doing it. So how sensitive the urine is um, in detecting other viral inclusion? which is between brackets decoy cells. <laughs> <laughs> no, decoy cells are basically related to polyoma, full stop. Oh. So they, are not, they are not related to viral inclusion. They are related to polyoma. This is a polyoma virus cell. It's known now to be related to polyoma, but it wasn't. Oh. Well, since we've known about it, we know that it was related. <laughs> to if you know something else, let me know. <laughs> but Dr. if Dr. knows something else, let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Riyad, Dr. Riyad, uh, Yes, uh, I think we are back to hemorrhagic cystitis. You can do really cystoscopy and bladder yes. biopsy. It can help a lot in diagnosing yeah. adenovirus. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's an easy way, really, you know, if you're not going to do graft biopsy, you can do simple cystoscopy, and you can demonstrate biopsy. with the biopsy, the, yes, bladder biopsy. Yes. It, is, it is histology, hemorrhagic cystitis is yes. histological diagnosis, yes. not yes. clinical diagnosis. But then, but, then it, but then it's a hemorrhagic cystitis, and yes. then you can suspect yeah. adenal. Yeah. But then yes. um, the question was, how would we know that this hemorrhagic cystitis is induced by adenovirus? This is well, well if, you yeah. if you document that in the bladder biopsy, uh, I think the message from all this discussion is just really minimization of, of immune all immune suppressive things. Oh, oh. Minimization is the key issue because all the complication really comes from overestimation, overkill with our immune suppressive therapy that we use. But we can't if you use minimum. <laughs> oh, yes, well, I, I, let, let's talk about rejection. Now, yeah. really, rejection currently, in the current era of the immune suppressive therapy, is almost down to single digit figure. We don't see rejection as much as we used to see in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. Let's really face this. Our degree of rejection nowadays is really very, very little in comparison to previous. I don't know the other group, what they think about it. But really, we overkill with our oversuppression immune suppressive therapy. Dr. Dawlat Bilal, shukran, Dr. Riyad. Dr. Dawlat? Ahlan, ahlan. Dr. Dawlat, this is the last comment, then. Uh, OK, so uh, I'm going back to Professor Maya Hasaballah, uh, because Professor Maya is the president elect of society. And I would like here to conclude this uh, webinar and conclude the pathology uh, because uh, I mentioned in the beginning that we have quiz for assessment and the attendee uh, who will uh, answer the quiz by 70% uh, score, they will be offered a certificate from the SNT 
uh, signed by the president and by Dr. Usam uh, for attending this activity for those who are interested in certificate acquisition. Professor uh, May. Uh, of course, uh, with them, I cannot thank you enough for uh, your extraordinary uh, resistance and coming up with this magnificent whole course of renal pathology. And I was just saying, maybe you didn't hear me, that this was very much needed by us nephrologists because uh, it's not um, so easy for us, really. Uh, you made things very easy. And anybody who will see this course later on on the YouTube will really regain a lot. And you can always, and thank you, Professor Hussain, of course, for that. You can always go back to it and, 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 and see it again. And, and, you know, so, so this is really, this was great. And we cannot thank you enough, but we try to thank you. And, uh, we do need to see you uh, again. So this is not the end. We'll have to see you again, and you have to think of something to update us uh, every now and then. Okay. Sure. So thank you very much. <laughs> this is the end of the of the month. This is the last session <laughs> of the pathology in the month. But in the second, in the coming month, we will meet again because, uh, as uh, Professor Halal mentioned, Dr. Wassam is half nephrologist and half pathologist. So all of us. Uh, cannot work without her help, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Wissam. Thank you all, uh, dear professors and colleagues for uh, waiting with us and your patience. And I think the, this is a treasure. Nephropathology from A to Z, it is a real treasure left for nephrologists and for pathologists as well. Thank you very much and goodbye. And this presentation will be uploaded before 10 a.m. next uh, morning, inshallah. Thank you, all Professor, Professor Riyad, Thank you. Faisal, all our guests from Arab world and from UK. Dr. Halawa, it was a very nice opportunity to work with you in the transplant pathology with Liverpool candidates. It is a real advantage. And uh, you enriched the, these four sessions by your um, experience and by your comments. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.